The thing you have to remember is that this was before the iPhone was introduced and no one knew what the iPhone would do. At the end of the day, there was a chip that they were interested in that they wanted to pay a certain price for and not a nickel more and that price was below our forecasted cost. I couldn't see it. It wasn't one of these things you can make up on volume. And in hindsight, the forecasted cost was wrong, and the volume was 100x what anyone thought. That remark was made by former Intel CEO, Paul Ottolini, in an interview with The Atlantic magazine in 2013, about six years after the launch of the iPhone. Hello and welcome to Strategy TLDR, a channel where we explain strategy concepts important for managing your business. In this episode we look at Intel, and how it missed being the engine inside the smartphone. Have you ever wondered that while many desktop PCs and laptops have the Intel Inside logo, why none of your smartphones have them? This is despite the fact that the smartphone is essentially a handheld computer and hardly a classic telephone. A smartphone can enable email, productivity tools, multimedia, social media, gaming, e-commerce, live interactive maps, audio, video communications, and many more functions that depend on data storage, image processing, combined with 4 or 5G, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth connectivity. These are packed into one chip that also has low power consumption. The era before smartphones was the PC era. Intel not only dominated the personal computer business, but was the powerful engine that pulled the industry forward with more and more powerful chips every 18 to 24 months. The PC manufacturers like HP, Dell, and software manufacturers like Microsoft aligned themselves to Intel's schedule and time pacing. But the chips that Intel made for laptops and PCs were consuming a lot of power and generated heat that had to be cooled by fans. Intel was not only earning huge revenue selling high-end PC chips, but it was also cornering most of the profit in the whole PC industry ecosystem. Given the small size of smartphones, Apple, Samsung, and other manufacturers needed chips that were less powerful than PCs and more importantly had much lower power consumption. Such a chip was designed by a then-little-known British company called Arm Holdings. It licensed its low-power consuming chip design to companies like Samsung. TSMC, Qualcomm etc. that made the ARM-based chips for the smartphones. Both Apple's and Android's mobile phones and tablets now run on these chips. When Apple was launching its iPhones, it approached Intel to manufacture and supply the less powerful, less battery-draining chips for smartphones that would also be much less expensive than the Intel processors for PCs. How much cheaper? According to a 2016 article by Timothy Lee and Vox, an entire mobile device could cost less than the price of a high-end Intel processor. So, for Intel entering the mobile chip business didn't seem profitable enough to be worth the trouble, according to the article. Such behaviors of industry leaders ignoring the next upcoming, low cost, and low capability, technological innovation has been well studied by the former Harvard Business School professor, Clayton Christensen. He called the phenomenon, disruptive innovation. According to him it is a lower cost, less sophisticated, less powerful, technological innovation that the current users do not want but there are other potential customers who are willing to adopt it for exactly the same reasons. This technology then gets adopted by more and more customers and over time its capability also improves significantly. Then it disrupts the old technology to become the dominant one. In fact, in the past, Intel itself had played an important part in disrupting the old mainframe and minicomputer industries lead by IBM and Digital Equipment Corporation respectively. Its early low-powered processors helped the personal computer industry to serve a new set of customers and disrupt the established computer industry of that time. But now, when it faced with a similar opportunity to disrupt its own powerful and high-priced processors, it did not take the lead as it did not want to lose its high revenue and high margins by making low-cost, low-margin chips for smartphones. Professor Clayton Christensen in his best-selling book, The Innovator's Dilemma, published in 1997, ten years before the iPhone, explains why the leading incumbents do not lead the disruptive innovation or quickly adapt to it. According to him, three classes of factors affect what an organization can and cannot do, its resources, its processes, and its values. Resources can be tangible like people, equipment, technologies, cash etc. or intangible like product design, information, brands, relations with suppliers, distributors, customers. These can be bought sold, transferred across the organization or even outside it. Companies like Intel had many highly capable employees who designed and built, sold, and distributed expensive processors for PCs. A company's processes help transform its resources into marketable products and services. There can also be invisible processes in the background that support decisions and they may involve internal negotiations within the organization. 
A mature company's processes would have evolved and been optimized as they gave the best results in transforming the organization's resources. Unlike resources, once established, processes are not so easy to change. Intel's design, manufacturing, and research and development processes were way ahead of competition and in fact set the pace for the industry. The third factor listed by Professor Christensen is values. These refer to the criteria used to make decisions about what will get a higher priority, what is an attractive business opportunity, and what is not. The successful, mature firms which are often the leading firms in the industry will have an established business model that requires a high gross profit margin and or a high growth rate. When a disruptive innovation opportunity like making low-cost mobile chip came along, the leading company, Intel, had the necessary resources and processes to make them. But its business model was that each chip sale should generate high revenue and profits, like what it got from $2,000 PC manufacturers. It was reluctant to accept the low price that Apple and other smartphone manufacturers could afford to pay as they were selling $300 to $500 phones at that time. This was exactly what former Intel CEO, Paul Odellini said in 2013 when he retired. The thing you have to remember is that this was before the iPhone was introduced and no one knew what the iPhone would do. At the end of the day, there was a chip that they were interested in that they wanted to pay a certain price for and not a nickel more and that price was below our forecasted cost. I couldn't see it. It wasn't one of these things you can make up on volume. And in hindsight, the forecasted cost was wrong and the volume was 100x what anyone thought. Despite being the industry leader, Intel failed to see the disruptive innovation potential of smartphones that needed low-powered, low-energy consuming chips and that one day they could be a larger market than PCs. Intel's loss was ARM, Qualcomm, Samsung and TSMC's gain. I hope this helped you to understand the dilemma that Intel faced when it had to develop low-cost, low-margin, low-powered, low-capability chips that it need to make for smartphone manufacturers than the high-margin, high-priced chips it was making for the PC manufacturers. It also failed to foresee that the smartphone business will scale so rapidly and will be larger than the PC and laptop business. The sources for this video are in the show notes.